what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of bring maybe a, a practical storyline to the type of high-level uh, information from a policy perspective that, that uh, Pat has gone through because I think what Pat talked about in terms of the, the policy arena and the planning arena, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the practical demonstration of what can be achieved at the end of that lengthy and arduous process, as I might describe it, and, and that the length and the arduous nature of the planning and permitting process for energy infrastructure, by the way, is exactly as it should be. Um, when you're building large infrastructural projects like this, uh, there will be concerns, there will be questions, there will be queries, and we need to have a planning process that can open the door and open that forum to the public debate around it. But I suppose ultimately what developers need is a conclusion and a timely conclusion, and, and I think in terms of the Mount Lucas project that we're developing no more than 10 or 15 kilometers down the road here, that is certainly something that we managed to achieve uh, after a long, hard push. And what I'm going to try to do is to talk to you about the supply chain opportunities that can emerge uh, if we have the potential to further develop large-scale wind farms, renewable energy generating plants on cutaway peatlands. Um, just very briefly from Bordemona perspective, I, I suspect that the vast majority of people in the room know who Bordemona are, and we know from surveys that are conducted on our behalf that the thing that people think most about when you talk about Bordemona is the good old Pete Briquette. Uh, that's what we do, that's what we have been doing very successfully for 75 odd years. But a bit that's probably growing very, very significantly that a lot of people uh, don't perhaps, uh, it doesn't click with people to the same extent, is our involvement in the, 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 the downstream generation end. And from a renewable energy perspective, Bordnemona as a company developed Ireland's first commercial wind farm, uh, a seven megawatt farm in Bellacoric in County Mayo. And that farm, the picture which you can see here on the screen, uh, was developed on a former cutaway peatlands, uh, the, the, the peatlands that served the 40 megawatt uh, Bellacoric power station that was owned and operated by ESB. Um, that station closed in the late 90s, around 2000, that, that period. And in the intervening period, Bordnemona has been looking at opportunities to further develop uh, wind generating assets on that site. Um, we followed on from that, I suppose, in, in, in 2006 when, as a supplier of peat to electricity generating stations, primarily in the Midlands, uh, Bordnemona decided to take the step into buying and owning and operating one of these power stations. And it purchased the Eden Dairy power station from E.ON, uh, the big German uh, utility company. And I would like to think that in purchasing that station, Bordnemona also acquired uh, a team of people who had the capabilities to look at further developments of generating assets on behalf of the company. Um, myself and colleagues who work with me and have worked with me at the power station have been involved in, in energy developments worldwide, globally. We've had guys in the team who've developed projects from Afghanistan to Iraq to right the way across the UK. So that capability came into the Bordnemona arena around 2006. And, and of course, it joined a very, very hard working team of individuals in Bordnemona who were looking at that time at the potential to develop generating assets on Bordnemona's land holding. Um, and as Pat has referred to, one of the very first things that we did was we added a, a peaking, peaking capacity to the, to the site in Eden Derry. Obviously, there was a commercial uh, backdrop to this, but one of the key things was the energy infrastructure that was there and the optimal use of grid connection and infrastructure on the site. Um, and that has been followed by, I suppose, the pursuit of support for national energy policy, which, as Andy has more than adequately described, there is a very, very clear shift, not just globally, but nationally in Ireland from generating electricity from fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy. And as a result of that type of policy, we in Bordnemona have been aggressively pursuing the decarbonisation of electricity generation at the Eden Derry site by year on year successively increasing the amount of sustainable biomass we use along with the peat that we are still able to gather commercially and economically in the local environment. And of course, the big, big focus for us was because of the nature and form of our land bank, we were able to successfully uh, achieve planning and permitting for an 80 megawatt wind farm on Mount Lucas uh, in County Offaly. 
as Pat has indicated. The Mount Lucas, what I think is very interesting about this story is that the Mount Lucas bog, if you look at its history, um, it has been providing energy for the state for more than 50 years. It provided uh, milled peat for the original fleet of peat-fired power stations that sat from the mid-60s uh, right through to the late 90s. It's still providing, elements of this bog are still providing peat for the Eden Derry station. And of course, it provided raw material for the manufacturing of briquettes at the, the local uh, uh, peat briquette manufacturing plant. What we're looking at here, thankfully, today is the opportunity that this particular piece of land in the Midlands has to continue to contribute to energy generation and energy security in the state, hopefully for at least another 50 to 60 years. And it is doing it in a manner and a way that we now believe to be sustainable. That's not to say that our forefathers who worked very, very hard to extract peat from that bog 40, 50, 30 years ago didn't think that the activity that they were at was sustainable. Times change and organizations and communities must move with those changing times. Um, the, the site itself uh, is located just off the, uh, or the R402, which is the main road between Edenderry and um, Tullamore, um, and, and, and the R400, which is the road between, excuse the pun, road, and uh, at the other end of it, it's heading towards Port Arlington or Brackna. Um, this is an aerial um, uh, photograph of, of the, 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 the site itself. And I always describe our peatlands, particularly when I'm in the UK, which I'm doing a lot at the moment to try to promote the potential that Ireland has to support the UK in its energy needs. I describe our peatlands as a bit like Craggy Island. That's exactly what it looks like. Um, you can argue whether there's mineral, it's, 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 a, it's a peatland island in the, middle, in the middle of mineral soil, or maybe in Cavan where we don't have that many bogs, we look at Offaly and we go, it's really, there's a bits of mineral soil in the middle of the bog. But that's the shape and form of what these sites look like. And I just draw your attention to the areas on the bottom of the slide here, the, the dark or brown areas. Those areas are still and will remain in peat production. So this is an active site through which we have a rail network carrying peat, and that will continue for the next decade or so until those peat fields in the, in, the, in, the, in the southern part of this site actually become brownfield themselves or become cutaways themselves. Uh, as Pat has said, there will be ultimately, this time next year, I hope there will be 28 turbines up and operating on that site. Um, but before you get there, in terms of supply chain opportunities, and I'm not going to go into the detail of this because I know the next panel of speakers bring you through the stages and the opportunities that are there in the project development phase of a project such as this. You're talking about things such as resource assessment, assessing the detailed level of wind or energy that transverses a site so that you can assess how you might economically and efficiently capture it. The whole important area of EIS and planning, the constraint assessments and the ologies, from ecology to hydrology to whatever ology you're having yourself. Very, very, very detailed assessments to be carried out contributing to the overall environmental impact statement that would be delivered as part of the planning process. Moving forward then to the more technical and engineering side of things, looking at wind farm layouts, where exactly will we locate these turbines? We've got to be cognizant of planning guidelines, distances from properties, managing noise, managing all of the issues that people will have concerns about. That is all done as part of the planning process, the pre-planning process, looking at technology, looking at the design and layout of the farm to minimize impacts such as noise and visual impacts. Obviously the whole area of grid connection. You can erect the turbines, you can pull the cables around the site, but ultimately connecting these projects to the grid and exporting the energy to the, to the demand centers is in itself a very, very significant element of the, of the development phase of these projects. And the bit that's forgotten, a lot of work goes into establishing business cases, financial modeling, bringing yourself to financial close, being able to garner the support of my fellow executives in Bordemona, of the board, and of course ultimately of our shareholder, that we are developing a solid business case here. We're not just building these things for the fun. One of the challenges you always have in an engineering organization is the engineers love to build things, things that move and rotate and do this, that, and the other. And they're, guy, they're like guys and gals sometimes in sweet shops when you bring them to, to technology places. But of course, at the end of it all, 
it has to make commercial sense for an organisation. And that in itself is a very, very significant challenge. And we in Board Nomona, we would use a lot of outside expertise and help and assistance in, in sense checking what we do from a commercial perspective. And then the whole area of procurement. European procurement legislation now, particularly for utility companies such as ours, is in absolute minefield. So luckily, there's a lot of work for external consultants and advisors and of course people in the legal profession to help us bring these projects through that minefield and ultimately see them developed into generating assets. So that's the sort of work that goes on in the background to developing a single wind farm or a single energy project. There's a, when we talk about spin-off jobs here, added jobs, it's in this type of area that people forget about. And, and I would suggest to you that in the vast majority of those areas, the, 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 the skill sets that are needed to bring a, a project to, at this stage of development sit in this very area, in this very room. They're Irish, they're people, guys and gals, who are looking for jobs and looking hard for jobs, and hopefully, if projects can continue to be developed in this area, organizations that provide these types of services can expand and grow. Um, ultimately, when we bring it through a project like the Mount Lucas through the, the, the financial close phase and you get the guy to sign the check that says, OK, go ahead and do it, you're, you're in then to negotiating your final contracts with uh, the consortium. And on the Mount Lucas project, we effectively had three major contracts. We had a contract for the supply of the turbines themselves, the erection and the commissioning of those turbines. And after a long and arduous procurement process, it was ultimately Siemens who were selected as our partners in that arena. There is, of course, in any of these projects, very, very, very significant elements of civil work. As you'll see in a moment, developments of roads, hard stands, very significant pieces of infrastructure in terms of turbine foundations, uh, adjoining road networks, upgrading the, lo the local road network to ensure that we comply with conditions of planning that allow us to transport materials safely to the site. And the civil work contract was awarded to Carey's in the, in the case of the Mount Lucas project. And then, of course, there's an electrical element, connecting up all of the wind turbines themselves, pulling the cables, and doing the electrical connection to the national grid. And ultimately, a, a consortium of Galetech and KTL were awarded that contract. Um, the project works themselves in terms of the practicalities associated with the planning conditions that we would have received from Offaly County Council and that were ultimately overseen by on board Planola. It was necessary to upgrade about six and a half kilometers of road networks in the area to safely facilitate the delivery of materials to site. Um, we also had to build a brand new 110 kV substation and of course the collector network and connect, connect the farm to the grid. Um, and within the site itself, we have had to develop 21 kilometers of internal roads to allow us access to all of the turbine locations uh, in a safe and secure manner. So all of these bits and pieces naturally are very, very significant infrastructural uh, builds and they require a very, very significant input from the civil end. I suppose the type of, the type of works that we in Ireland are famous for globally, uh, this is meat and drink to us here. You know, it, there's nothing new or novel in any of this, to be honest with you, no matter what the scale or size of the wind farm or energy project that you're developing. Um, this is a stretch of road on the R402 uh, which we would have upgraded a one kilometre stretch between Balnagar and Dangan. Uh, that work was completed last summer to facilitate the project. Uh, we would also have done a very, very significant upgrade, uh, which was quite challenging, uh, through the village of Dangan. Uh, it's about a 3.25 kilometre stretch through the village of Dangan. Um, and I remember at the time uh, the local festival in Dangan, which occurs towards the end of August, the one thing we were told by the local community, whatever you do, lads, make sure you have it finished before then. And we said in June, there'd be no problem. We're doing it the time of year where there's good weather and long days. And you'll all remember what happened during the summer, if you want to call it a summer of last year. But thankfully, and there, there is disruption during these construction phases. We've all been through it when you're building roads and you're upgrading roads, there's traffic lights and you're sitting in traffic jams. But I would like to think that at the end of the day, we did a fine job that has added considerably to the appearance of, of the lovely town and village of Dangan, which is the, the, the nearest village to the, site, to the site itself. And then as we approach the site, that's a, a piece of road, upgraded road, about two and a half, two and a quarter kilometers of upgrade 
uh, a difficult upgrade, challenging upgrade from the R402 junction with the R400 right down to the site entrance itself. And that is the site entrance uh, for those of you who would be familiar with the site of the cranes on the, the FOSS training centre um, at the Mount Lucas site. The wind farm entrance is adjacent to the entrance to the, to the, to the FOSS facility. Um, and of course, <laughs> d developing, when we talk about these sites being cut away peatlands, unfortunately, as I learned, I'm not a peat expert at all, and when I joined Bordenamona, I knew how to burn it. Uh, but I wasn't really that familiar with how we got it very much and the challenges. Unfortunately, peatlands in Ireland are not flat at the base. Uh, they're a bit like my own county, drumlands and hills and pieces. So wh when we cut away, when we describe a peatland as cut away, there will be areas of rather deep peat that you have to move through uh, on any of these sites. And I think the one key thing that Bordemona has is nobody knows our sites like the guys who've worked on these sites for 30, 40 years. The records, the type of information that we have, which is absolutely invaluable in designing the engineering works that need to go around these sites. And that's actually a picture, not from the Mount Lucas site, but it's one of the more challenging ones on the Brooklyn site, which is a 40 megawatt farm. We're cur currently developing um, on the county boundaries of Tipperary, Leash and Kilkenny. That's on the Kilkenny side of the site. And you can see that at times we have to dig our way or move our way through quite considerable mounds of peat to lay down the road. Uh, but it's something that we're well used to doing in the organization. Um, ultimately, we develop, developed uh, the, the um, 21 kilometers of roads. All of the road network now on the site is effectively finished. It's not finished to the finished standard, but it's finished uh, in terms of the overall layout of the roads. And the one thing that I would like to point out uh, and there's a lot of, we've had lots of discussion about ultimately using this site as a local amenity, and it's certainly something we want to do, but we don't finish the roads to the standard that we do out in Dangan, for example. So we've got to be careful about the sort of access that we might be able to provide here, uh, and that's something that we, are, we will be working with the local authority and the, and the local community on, because these sites are vast, and they certainly should be used as amenities once the wind farm is up and generating, um, and it's safe to do so. Um, that's a picture of a railway crossing on the site, so there was a lot of engineering works had to go into moving railway lines around and doing overpasses or, 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 or crosses. We're, we've no underpasses on this particular site itself, so from an engineering perspective, it's relatively straightforward. I think one of the things you should notice for those of you who've never been on a site, this picture clearly demonstrates to you the vastness of these sites. When you stand in the middle of Mount Lucas and you look left and right, north and south, it's just vast open tracts of land and that is why they are so suitable for the development of the large-scale type of projects that we're developing on this site. Um, that's a picture of the site itself, um, same layout as we had from the original photograph. What was vitally important to the commercials of this project was the very, very pale blue line that you can see on the southern boundary. That's the 110 kV line that Airgrid indicated in their transmission development, their network development plan of 2005, I think it was, that they wished to construct a 110 kV line between Thornsbury, just outside of Tullamore, and Cushling, which is the, the substation at Eden Derry. When that particular plan came into being, the guys and gals who were looking at development opportunities on our land said, hey up, here's an opportunity perhaps to develop a large scale wind farm on this site because we now had a very, very short run technically to the national grid in terms of connection. And this site, I can tell you, has one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, connection cost of any wind farm anywhere in the country. And it was crucial, absolutely crucial, to the final commercial push to get the project over the line. In the southern boundary here, ringed by the purple line, you see the new 100, the location of the 110 kV substation on the site. And this is a picture of the, the build of that substation that will ultimately connect to the national grid. The, part-built pylon that you see erected here will ultimately be handed back to the ownership of Michael, who's sitting in the front row, and his colleagues in Airgrid. That will be part of their infrastructure. We're building that piece under contestable build, as they call it, and we will ultimately hand the infrastructure back to Airgrid when it's built for, their, for them to maintain and operate it. Um, the substation works are now completed. They were on the critical path, and we'll be handing the site over to Michael and his colleagues to energize it in the next month or six weeks so power can be back-fed to the site, which will allow us then to bring the turbines to the site and erect them and commission them. Um, so you can see 
pictorially that the type of work that goes into the development of these large-scale wind farms, there's nothing, it's challenging, but there's no rocket science to this, absolutely none. It is all based on skill sets, the vast majority of which we have in this lovely country of ours. So the, on that site today, there are 150 people busily working away this morning, involved in various aspects of construction. Um, the, the job that has to be done now is the delivery and erection of the 28 3 megawatt turbines. Um, and the delivery of turbines will happen to the site sometime in October, November time. Um, the turbines themselves are, as I've indicated, they're 3 megawatt uh, direct drive turbines. And they are going to be large. There is no question or doubt about that. And one of the challenges with developing large scale wind farms such as this is ensuring that from a visual impact perspective, we can manage that. Um, and I think people will be surprised, even though these machines, when you're standing under them, are very, very large beasts, 100 metres to the hub height, 150 metres to the tip height. Interestingly, given the foliage cover that you have on the roads around the, the local network, I actually think it'll be quite hard to see the turbines when you're up very close to them. If you're coming over Boston Hill in County Kildare, and you're looking down across the Bog of Allen, you'll probably just about make them out, just as you make out the existing power stations in Eden Derry and, and the cement plant in, in, in Kinnegad. Um, so the preparation work for the delivery of those turbines to erect the turbines themselves will require certainly one of the biggest cranes that has ever been used in Ireland, um, and to position and make sure that, that crane doesn't sink or disappear away. I see Tom Parlin here making sure that he knows what has to be done. The hard stand areas are very, very significant pieces of engineering, and again, it's civil work. It's very, very specific design in terms of load-bearing capacity, but all of that work is now coming to a completion on the site. The 28 hard stands are now completed and ready for the said crane to arrive. Um, the other big piece of work that is just going on on the site now is is, is, is building the actual turbine foundations themselves. And of course, given that the turbines are quite large, it is necessary to ensure that they sit on very, very solid foundations. And this is a picture of the original excavation. Again, guys and diggers. And I don't mean to be, I'm not condescending here. This is the sort of stuff that we in Ireland are brilliant at. We do it globally and we do it really, really well. And that's a picture of the first dig to dig down to the level at which the engineers have said you need to start building this foundation. That's a picture of the, the base, the first base, it's a, 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 the blinding on the first base, the floating foundation on the site. There are seven floating foundations and 21 piled foundations and you can talk to the civil engineers about that because I have no idea what they're talking about when they go into this sort of stuff, but it looks very, very impressive. Um, on top of that foundation, that blinding base, you will of course, it's reinforced concrete with steel and steel bar erection in it. So again, the types of people that are needed to do this type of work, it's very, very skilled work, but they're all Irish guys that are doing it. It's as simple as that. They do it all over the world. And that is a, is a picture of the, the steel reinforcement being finalized just before the first pour, the concrete pour. The concrete pours themselves, I think there are four foundations. Some of my colleagues are in their audience. There's certainly three poured. Um, they had to be delayed for three weeks. The last time I spoke here, I was telling people that we were due to pour concrete foundations this week, but it was too cold. <laughs> Imagine that in Ireland. It was too cold to cure the concrete. So the farmers think they have troubles at the moment, and they do. We sympathize with you because we couldn't pour and cure our concrete. Um, but thankfully, the weather has picked up a little bit, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the picture of the first completed foundation on the Mount Lucas site. A very, very historic day, in my view, from the perspective of Bordnemona. Very, very historic. Seeing that vast open landscape that is Mount Lucas beginning now to look like the next generation of energy generating sites in the Midlands. For all of us in Bordnemona, that was a very, very proud day. Very proud day. And I can tell you that to get to that point in the project, it started in 2005. The turbines will generate, we hope, at the beginning of 2013. That was eight years of a long, hard slog. And at times, I would have neatly folded my papers on the desk in the evening and said, John, this ain't going to happen. 
because at every step along the way of these big, big infrastructure projects, you meet major, major problems. You meet opposition. You meet financial issues. You meet technical issues. You meet all sorts of issues. And if it were not for the dedication of my own team within Bordnemona, for the support that was afforded to us by my colleagues in the executive of the company and by our board, and ultimately the support of the shareholder, we would not have spent 18 hours two weeks ago pouring that concrete foundation. It looks lovely. The work to get us there was immense. And I say that with regard to the future opportunities that are there, because I have no doubt there will be days when I will walk out of rooms and go, Riley, forget about it. It ain't going to happen. But we won't do that. When we get to those days, we will regroup, we will understand the challenges and the issues, and we will move on in a constructive, open, and transparent manner. And hopefully, we would like to see four or 500 of those turbine bases constructed in the next six or seven years across the cutaway peatlands in the Midlands, those vast open areas of land with three or four megawatt turbines sitting on top of them, generating energy for the domestic market, and hopefully, like our food export market, generating electricity for export. That is what the opportunity is about. That is a picture of the very top of the, the turbine base itself, where the, the turbine, the tower, will be affixed or will be attached to the concrete base. Um, so overall, you can see that the amount of the type of work that has gone on on this site to date is very much stuff, as I've said before, that we're well used to dealing with in this country. Um, we have built on the island of Ireland to date two gigawatts of onshore wind. We've become very, very good at it as a nation. The potential, from my perspective, is another four to six gigawatts, strategically located in the right place throughout the country. On this project, 150 people, an 80 megawatt project, to give you a sense, will be employed at the peak of construction. We're just reaching the peak now. There are tens of jobs, hundreds of jobs, in the development phase. There were hundreds of people employed at various points in the development phase of this project. Hundreds. And ultimately, on an 80 megawatt wind farm, we in Bordnemona expect to employ 10 people on a full-time basis in terms of long-term operations and maintenance. It, from an indirect perspective, there were hundreds and hundreds of spin-off jobs and spin-off activities just to get the project to this point. Things that we forget about. Services, local accommodation, catering, logistics. If you wanted to find a B&B &B around the Mount Lucas, Tullamore, Eden Derry area at the moment, I think you could probably just about forget it. That's the type of economic activity that we don't always remember is associated with projects like this. Um, I won't say any more about the emerging opportunity, except to say that we've heard a lot of debate and discussion about this, and sorry, that's a lovely picture of Her, Her Highness Kate Middleton, very nice lady. That's not what I want you to look at. This, this was, I've heard a lot of debate over the last few months about the rights and wrongs of what's going on here, but what is absolutely factual, as Andy has referred to, absolutely factual, is that the UK is on the brink of a very, very serious energy crisis. It's not us saying it. It's the Daily Telegraph. It's not the Sun or the Star. Or it's no offence to papers like that. It's the Daily Telegraph. And what is really interesting is the editorial that sat in that piece, which was from February the 20th. I was over with Her Majesty's civil service that day discussing the potential for generating renewable energy from cutaway peatlands in the Midland and supplying it into the UK. They want to talk about this. It is one of the biggest mass markets in the world. We're sitting adjacent to them. They have a problem. We have a solution. I hope to God we don't blow it. We in Bordnemona have, are developing our Clean Energy Hub project, which is our response to this emerging opportunity in the UK. We've identified approximately 20,000 hectares of our overall 80,000 hectare land bank, just, just 20,000 hectares, this is where our focus is at the moment. It, 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 it is, as you will see, located in the area that Pat had clearly identified and is clearly identified in the county development plan in Offaly. It's effectively in East Offaly and into West Kildare. 
Um, it's about a 50 kilometer stretch from the town of Newbridge or Enfield over very close to Tullamore here in, in, in the west and from the boundaries of the M6 motorway at Kinnegad to the boundaries of the M7 and M M8 motorways that pass by Port Arlington and Port Leash in the south. And when Pat referred to the energy infrastructure in Offaly, he forgot to mention, Pat, the wonderful road network that transverses this county and through the Midlands. That is an asset that you couldn't buy at this stage in terms of opening up these areas for development because bringing these large turbines to the site is not really a challenge. It's not like bringing them up the side of a mountain in West Cork or the side of a mountain in Kerry where over a gigawatt has been hauled up the side of mountains in the last 10 years. We can bring big turbines to these sites because of the local motorway network that allows us to bring things in through Dublin Port, around the M50, through the tunnel, out onto the motorway network, very, very close proximity to the site. And then working closely with the local authorities and the permitting authorities in the local areas, upgrading those roads that are necessary to allow turbines to be transported to the site. Our assessment to date, we've been at this for two years, has identified very clearly, very clearly, that in this area, and you can see the Mount Lucas site there in the middle, that can accommodate 80 megawatts of generating capacity. So approximately 15 Mount Lucases are available to us in this area, and that's what gives you 1.2 gigawatts or 1,200 megawatts of potential. And I want to make it very, very clear at this stage that that's all it is, is potential. We've been criticized in the media for not consulting. We haven't even begun to move forward in terms of the initial steps of ultimately designing what might sit here. But what we're very, very clear about is that these open tracks of cutaway peatlands could, could, if you use Mount Lucas as a reference, accommodate 1.2 gigawatts for connection to the domestic system, if it could take it, or for export. Finally, I will leave you with a picture that is a very interesting one. This is the second project that we're developing at the moment is in, we call it our Brocana site. It's down in, 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 in Tipperary, just off the M8 motorway. As you're traveling on the M8 motorway to Cork, the town of Johnstown and Orlingford on your left-hand side, if you look over to the right, you will see a, an existing 34 megawatt wind farm that has just recently had 12 two megawatt turbines erected adjacent to it. It's an expansion of that site to bring it to 50 megawatts, or close to 60 megawatts. And that is sited on marginal land around the Lachine mine site adjacent to Bordemona's peatland up in the top left-hand corner. We are currently erecting 40 megawatts of capacity. And when you're driving down that M8 motorway this time next year, you will look out and you will see turbines of different sizes. You won't actually be able to tell which are the larger ones and which are the smaller ones from that distance. But you will have 100 megawatts of generating capacity sitting between Bordemona's lands and the adjacent marginal land surrounding it. 100 megawatts. 20 of those across the Midlands gives you two gigawatts of export potential. And I can tell you that our friends in the United Kingdom are extremely interested in projects of that size. It looks as though they will be willing to put the cash on the table to allow those projects to be developed. And I hope, with the experience that we're garnering every day in Bordemona, that we will be able to make a major, major contribution to the developments of those projects across the Midlands, which will secure employment and prosperity for, for large numbers of people living here in the Midlands. Thank you for your attention.